and Peruvians, of a wide variety of networks of belonging. I also sense, though, that these networks of beyond, belonging went beyond the Aprista commun exile community in Chile. It went beyond that moment in time, and indeed often went beyond Chile and Peru. Um, so many of the cultural organizations that I'll be investigating, and congresses and revistas, you know, that brought together Chilean and Peruvian intellectuals, were continental, no? Um, were not based in Chile or Peru. So I'm thinking particularly of the um, El Repertorio Americano, which was directed by Joaquin Garcia Monge in Costa Rica. I'm also thinking of the Pan American Union. Um, so many of these um, sites of encounter were continental. Many of them were global, so, no? So one instance, for example, is the um, intellectual um, um, the Institute for Intellectual Cooperation, which was based in Paris and linked to the United Nations. That included Gabriela Mistral. It also included um, some Peruvian intellectuals. We could also think about the Congreso de, de Americanistas or the Congreso de las Razas, which I found took place in London in 1911 and involved both Chileans and Peruvians. Um, there's just a couple more points that I want to make with regard to this slide, um, and then a couple of things um, about theoretical frameworks that I want to talk about the project more broadly, and then I'll move on to Chambi in Chile. Um, by listing the sites of encounter that I'm interested, interested in, I think also indicates the primary source material I'll be working with on the project. No, so documents pertaining to different cultural organizations, actas of various congresses, journals themselves, the indexes of journals, the catalogues of publishing houses. And one source that I'll be looking at closely um, and doesn't appear explicitly here um, is correspondence between intellectuals as well. Um, and second, I want to stress that one of the key objectives of the project is not only to understand better Chilean and Peruvian ideas about race um, during the first half of the 20th century, but also I'm very interested in how these ideas were circulating. No? And I'm, I'm very interested in um, the mechanisms and the vehicles through which these ideas about race um, were communicated. Okay. Um, now, I have to admit that I don't yet have a clear theoretical framework for this project, um, but I think I'm starting to clarify my ideas about what kinds of approaches might be useful for me, and I, um, I'm going to talk just about a couple here. Um, Stephen Vertovec um, provides a really useful um, summary of the phenomenon known as transnationalism, and on the widespread academic interest in transnationalism in his book, oddly titled Transnationalism, um, he, defines, he defines transnationalism as, quote, economic, social, and political linkages between peoples, places, and institutions crossing nation-state borders and spanning the world. Now, what I'm talking about in this project are most definitely transnational encounters. No? Um, but what I like, or what I find useful about the term transnational, is that it, that it acknowledges the existence of national back borders. No? That it acknowledges the existence of national boundaries at the same time as it's all about transcending those national boundaries. So for example, um, and here I come back again to Ciro Alegria, he talks a lot about a shared American identity, a shared Andean identity um, with Gabriela Mistral. But he also articulates a very close identification with Peru, no? with his mi patria, mi país, mi pueblo. He talks about that a lot. So he talks about both at the same time. I've also been thinking um, a lot about what digital humanities has to offer um, and what we might gain from a quantitative reading um, of Chilean-Peruvian intellectual networks. Um, Franco Moretti has this really intriguing book um, called um, Graphs, Maps and Trees, um, in which he argues for the value of a distant reading. 
Um, and the need to move from exceptional events or specific seminal texts to a larger mass of facts. Um, with fewer detailed elements, he says, we get a sharper sense of the overall um, connections. He's particularly interested in mapping out um, the world of the 19th century novel in England. And his starting point is that a scholar of the 19th century novel um, can never read all the novels of the 19th century, so that maybe it's helpful to step back a little bit and gather together that mass of facts about those novels. Who's writing what, when, where, who's publishing, what are the main themes of the book, rather than, or often as well as reading in detail some of the novels, no? Um, so I started to think that it might be useful um, to start putting together a data set of the large mass of facts of Ch Chilean Peruvian intellectual encounters. Which editoriales in Chile um, were publishing Ch Peruvian authors? At what point, with what, d uh, what dates, with what print runs, what cost were the books being sold at? Which Peruvian authors were they publishing? And, and also, if you start mapping out what other authors they were publishing at the same time, can you get a sense of the proportion um, that says an editorial like Nacimiento, is it, is it published, is 10% of, of its books published by Peruvian authors? 3% if you map it out in comparison to the nationalities of other authors that it's publishing. Um, <coughs> We could, also, uh, we could also do this with journals, no? going through the indexes of, um, of um, new, new, the major journals in Peru and Chile, and again, looking at what they're publishing when, um, who they're publishing and when. Um, once we've got this data um, in a kind of access relational database, you could start um, to run some com compute. This is where you can see this is very new for me some computational analysis over the data and see what a machine gives us, you know? see, what, um, see what a machine takes, uh, um, what it tells us. Um, social network analysis can also be helpful here um, to, to, with this material, to kind of tease out that the hubs, you no, know, um, or the central nodes, if you like, of Chilean Peruvian intellectual networks, the key players, the key institutions. Now, we might not find out anything from this that we didn't already know, or that we didn't already have a sense of. Um, so it's clear, without doing this, that Gabriela Mistral is a major intellectual figure no, uh, in the early 20th century, and that she links many different Latin American intellectuals. We could say the same of the Mexican, José Vasconcelos. Um, but it could help to provide concrete, more concrete evidence of this, and it could help to visualize it in different ways as well. Um, so, I've started, I'll just talk about this for like two minutes and then move on. Um, I've started putting together a data set of Mistral's, Gabriela Mistral's correspondence um, from um, published collections of her letters, from secondary literature that mentions her letters, um, electronic and library-based archives of her unpublished letters, and noting um, who she wrote to, who wrote to her, where they were from, and when. So we might begin to get a broader sense, for example, of where Peruvians fit into her um, epistolary, I can't pronounce that word very well, networks. Um, and we can also look at what she writes about, obviously, in the letters. Now, there are some major problems with this kind of analysis. No? So I've, I've, started in, I've input about 400 different letters. Um, it just so happens that one of, the so one of the sources I've used is a collection of letters between um, the Argentine Victorio Campo and Mistral that Elizabeth Oran and um, Doris Mayer put together. Now, in that, there's um, 130 letters. So of my, so far, my data set of 400 letters, there's 130 or so with a Argentine. No, that would make it look like a quarter of her letters were, at least a quarter of her letters were... Um, with Argentines, but of course, it's been skewed by you know um, the fact that many people um, pick on specific figures that she's writing with, you no, know, and write um, produce books of that correspondence. Um, if we digitise all her letters, um, again, we can start 
potentially doing some quite exciting things with them. Um, this isn't. So this is an example of it not being <laughs> so exciting. Um, the, this is a word cloud, a very basic word cloud that we can take from the letters of uh, um, a collection of Ciro Alegria's letters to Gabriela Mistral that were published as part of the collection Epistolario Americano. Um, now, it's not very useful at the moment. Um, in, I'm not sure if it tells us anything that's very useful, partly because um, I have to do a more refined search and take out very common words, you know, like usted or también. That doesn't really tell us um, anything. But one thing I do notice is that in, so in a word cloud of 200, 300 words taken from letters from Sierra Alegre to Mistral, not once does the word indio or indígena or raza appear. <laughs> so it makes me start to think, okay, am I looking for something <laughs> that's not there or that's not there prominently? No. It's also, um, I thought, maybe interesting that Chile and Peru are here, but not America and not El Continente. Um, okay, so I think we have to be very um, careful and very wary of this quantitative approach to study of intellectual networks. Um, not least because it misses out, quite obviously, the human dimension of those networks. Um, but I think it's worth at least exploring my, what it might have to offer us um, and how it might help us to understand better Chilean-Peruvian intellectual connections. Of course, I think it only makes sense to do it in conjunction with in-depth studies you know, of specific intellectual encounters. The bigger picture makes no sense without a detailed understanding of the smaller parts that make up that bigger picture. So now I come on to one of those um, smaller parts. Um, much brilliant work has already been written on the indigenous Peruvian photographer Martin Chambi. I'm thinking particularly of Deborah Poole's work, um, uh, also Jorge Coronado, James Scora, Andres Garay, and a number of others. Now, what emerges from this scholarship, either directly or indirectly, is that it's very difficult to impose a unifying narrative on Chambi, either on him and his life story or on his photography, which is why he's such a fascinating figure. So, for example, um, his most renowned photograph like this one, it, um, titled, it's, it ha, it's had a couple of different titles given it by, by different curators, um, but it is often usually referred to as El Indio y su Jama. Um, his most renowned photographs, like this one, and this is one of the photographs that he took to Chile in 1936, tend to idealize and romanticize indigenous peoples. They also seem um, to prioritize the indigenous past. Um, especially his photos you know, of um, archaeological ruins, um, his most famous photographs of Machu Picchu. They also seem to prioritize an indigenous past over an indigenous present. And yet in other photographs, for instance, his photograph of indigenous campesinos awaiting trial in a courthouse in Cusco, or these amazing photographs of him and his friend Mario Yanez on brand new motorbikes set against a background of the urban poverty in Cusco, here we see um, indigenous people clearly you know, as active historical subjects who, as Jorge Coronado says, quote, both resist and demand a space in modernity. So we can, f can find like these kind of simple stories in Chambi's photographs. We can also find much more complicated stories. Now, Chambi himself straddled the traditional and the modern no, in early 20th century Peru, or the first half of 20th century Peru, speaking Quechua and Spanish, maintaining strong sentimental ties with his tierra, whilst mastering the modern technology of photography and making a decent living from that photography. Now, James Scorer talks of Chambi's ethnic elasticity. Um, I think it's also important to talk about his political elasticity. Um, he did not open, Chambi did not openly affiliate with any one particular political organization or political party. He took photographs celebrating Cusco's elites, 
no, and the numerous different events in which they were involved. He also used photography, though, to protest against inequality and injustice. So this meant that Chambi could work for many different groups, no, many different people. I'm really interested in this history of the reception of Chambi and the reception of his photography. I'm particularly interested in what happens to his photographs and through his photographs when he exhibits them in Chile in 1936. So Chambi is in Chile in 1936 for approximately three months between February and May um, 1936. Um, Chambi, Martin Chambi was not, an, uh, um, was not an official artist of the Peruvian establishment, to the same extent, say, as Diego Rivera could be seen to be an official, um, <coughs> an official artist of the post-revolutionary state in Mexico. Chambi never received any direct help from government institutions in Peru. As told by both the Chilean and Peruvian press, though, Chambi's visit to Chile was at least quasi-official. It was reportedly facilitated and sponsored by the Peruvian Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and according to La Nación, Chambi invited the Peruvian ambassador in Chile, Pedro Irigoyen, and other prominent members of the, diplomat of the Peruvian diplomatic corps um, in Santiago to his exhibition that he held in the offices of La Nación in Santiago. Perhaps more significantly, um, the then president of Chile, Arturo Alessandri, arranged for a private meeting with the Peruvian photographer. Um, without knowing enough about it, I don't know if that's unusual or how unusual that is for a president to receive in private um, a visiting photographer. For the Cusqueño newspaper Los Andes, Chambi's trip had one principal objective, and that was to market Peru, and particularly Cusco, as an ideal destination for Chilean holidaymakers. <laughs> um, el interés de este viaje reside para nosotros en la propaganda efectiva que con la exhibición de sus fotos ha de hacer Chambi, por el conocimiento de nuestra riqueza arqueológica, contribuyendo, I can never say that word, contribuyendo, Así a despertar interés por conocer nuestra región en nuestros vecinos del sur. More than 20 years later, when the national press was celebrating Chambi's 50th anniversary as a professional photographer, El Deber of Arequipa asserted that Chambi had done more for tourism in Peru than all tourism agencies put together. <laughs> And Chambi himself, both at the time and retrospectively, claimed that one of his main aims as a photographer was to show the world the be natural beauty of Peru. More often than not, particularly the natural beauty of the Cusco region. To promote tourism in Peru, or to promote Peruvian tourism, was not, however, Chambi's only objective when he went to Chile in 1936. And he made no secret of this fact, particularly when he was talking to the Chilean press. So as narrated here in the Santiago-based Revista Hoy, Chambi went to Chile as a self-proclaimed representative of the indigenous Quechua race in order to denounce and undermine what he perceived to be or what he had read about Chilean racist attitudes towards indigenous peoples. Um, he leído que en Chile se cree que los indios no tienen cultura, que son bárbaros, que tienen una inferioridad mental y expresiva notable al lado de los blancos o europeos. Yo nunca he creído en eso porque conozco a mis hermanos de raza y a los otros. Pero me parece que más elocuente que una opinión son los testimonios gráficos y por ello he, he aprendido esa tarea. Llevo en mi archivo más de 200 fotografías de diversos aspectos de la cultura quechua. And then later on, so, me, gusta, me gustaría que los te testigos imparciales y objetivos vieran este acervo. It's interesting here that he's saying that there are many who wouldn't be impartial or objective. No. Por eso haré la exhibición en Viña primero y luego, si es posible, en Peruvians, of a wide variety of networks of belonging. 
I also sense, though, that these networks of beyond, belonging went beyond the Aprista commun exile community in Chile. It went beyond that moment in time, and indeed often went beyond Chile and Peru. Um, so many of the cultural organisations that I'll be investigated, interested in, I think also indicates the primary source material I'll be working with on the project. No, so documents pertaining to different cultural organizations, actas of various congresses, journals themselves, the indexes of journals, the catalogues of publishing houses. And one source that I'll be looking at closely, which I found took place in London in 1911 and involved both Chileans and Peruvians. Um, there's just a couple more points that I want to make with regard to this slide, um, and then a couple of things um, about theoretical frameworks that I want to talk about the project more broadly, and then I'll move on to Chambi in Chile. Um, by listing the sites of encounter that I'm interested in, and congresses and revistas you know, that brought together Chilean and Peruvian intellectuals, were continental, no? Um, were not based in Chile or Peru. So I'm thinking particularly of the um, El Repertorio Americano, which was directed by Joaquin Garcia Monge in Costa Rica. I'm also thinking of the Pan American Union. Um, so many of these um, sites of encounter were continental. Many of them were global, so, no? So one instance, for example, is the um, intellectual. Um, um, the Institute for Intellectual Cooperation, which was based in Paris and linked to the United Nations. That included Gabriela Mistral. It also included um, some Peruvian intellectuals. We could also think about the Congreso de Americanistas or the Congreso de las Raza, 